Well, welcome. It says a lot about you that you're here at uh, 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Um, I will start by um, expressing a, a strong sentiment um, of appreciation for local officials. Having been a, a, a local official myself, it really is where the work is done. And um, people who understand you, uh, you know, it's, it's, I joke, but it's really not a joke that if, when a dog barks in the middle of the night, the mayor gets the phone call. And um, they're the ones closest to you, so thank you for your service. Um, I thought I might start uh, today. Uh, this is the first of three town hall meetings. Um, I, I would assume, welcome, I would assume on top of mind for a lot of, buddy, a lot of, every, a lot of us is the shooting. And um, I kind of just wanted to start there and, and uh, share my thoughts with you on that and then jump right into questions. Does that sound good? Um, one of the things that's been interesting to me I'm now in, I'll call it 12 weeks. I said 10 for a while, but it's been about 12, 12 weeks uh, that I've been in office. Um, and it's been a pretty interesting 12 weeks. Um, if, if you look, it's been pretty close to a major something um, on an average about once per week, whether it's tax reform or shutdown or immigration or, or the shooting, memos. Um, I mean, there's, there's always something. And it's interesting that many people have kind of been conditioned in this environment that we're in uh, for elected officials to come out with a, a statement or a response immediately following these big incidences. And I didn't on this one, and it was very uh, strategic uh, because I didn't want to come out with a statement that was hollow. I didn't want to come out with a statement that wasn't thoughtful. And instead of coming out with the immediate stereotypical our prayers are with these good people, um, I held off. I felt a lot of pressure, a lot of it was self-imposed that people were waiting to hear from me and waiting for a statement, and, but we waited just a little over a day and um, tried to be a little bit more thoughtful. And I'd actually like to just read the statement to you and then see if you have questions about it, if, if that's okay. Um, if you're like me, <coughs> I have printed in 18 fonts so I can read it without my glasses. Um, all right, during the last 24 hours, many have spoken out on the violent shooting at, that left 17 dead. For me, I have used this time for deep reflection and soul searching. I've not been ready to issue a statement because, like many of you, I've grown weary of the inaction we have seen after communities witness horrific events, like what has taken place in Florida this week. Although I think, it's off, I think offering condolences and prayers for the victims and their families is appropriate, I keep asking myself what I would expect from my elected leaders if one of those was my children or grandchildren that was killed. As a supporter and protector for the Second Amendment, I call on my friends and associates to show leadership and to not retreat. We understand firearms and we are the most qualified to bring answers forward. We can and must provide solutions that both honor Second Amendment rights and protect our neighborhoods and schools. We need to start somewhere, I mean really start. We are sad, hurt, angry, and frustrated. So let's use this as our motivation to focus on solutions, not just feel-good solutions, but real answers that truly answer the problem. To me, that means looking at mental illness, school security, warning signs, and yes, even who can access firearms. Below, I've outlined four steps that I have and will continue to support, to support immediately. We must properly enforce gun laws and regulations currently on the books every single time. Additionally, the Senate should follow our lead in the House and pass the Fix Nix Act, which, with my support, passed the House on December 6, 2017. This important legislation enforces current background check laws by applying penalties to government agencies for not reporting information to the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, Nexus. One of the shootings, I forget how long ago it was, um, the gentleman that got the firearm wouldn't have gotten the firearm if people had reported the information into this Nixus system, and they hadn't. And we've got that problem throughout the country that we've got the database, but uh, state agencies are not reporting the data up into that. We must outlaw any other device that con converts a, legally wep a legal weapon into an illegal weapon. Three, Congress must pass legislation that provides further resources to help law enforcement teachers and administrators identify warning signs. For this purpose, I've co-sponsored H.R. 4909, the Stop School Violence Act of 2018. This legislation reauthorizes a grant program for school security and specifically focuses on training schools and communities to identify warning signs and to intervene before a shooting takes place. 
And fourth, we need to take a comprehensive look at school security. We must dedicate more resources to protect our schools with the same level of commitment that we use to protect our celebrities, elected officials, and airports. I find myself, particularly in Washington, D.C., surrounded by security. Um, and nobody goes where they shouldn't go. Um, and we've done this at airports. Uh, you remember 9-11, we changed dramatically how we protect our airports. And I actually think, unfortunately, it's time to start looking at our schools, our school designs, our fencing, our, our perimeters, our points of entry, um, and, um, and dealing with that as well. Let there be no doubt, I'm an advocate for Americans' constitutionally guaranteed right to keep and bear arms. I've spent much of my life professionally helping law enforcement through building training facilities. I've even lectured for the NRA. I'm a gun owner, and I would never give that up. But that said, it's time for Congress to find our voice and do the right thing. And I feel like what's happened often in this debate is the two sides kind of retreat to these, um, it's mental illness, it's not guns, um, and you're not willing to do anything on guns. And I would like to see that stop. I'd like to see us uh, take every possible idea on the table and debate it. Um, the, People, a lot of people responded to this with ideas. And I'm starting to now collect all those ideas. And one of them is uh, school teachers should be allowed to carry firearms. Well, let's have a debate about that. Would that make our schools safer or not? If we don't ask those questions and we're not willing to talk about them, uh, then I don't think we'll get to the right answers. Um, I don't know if there's any specific questions on that or if you want to just jump into other questions, I'd be happy to go wherever you'd like, yeah. In your statement, you mentioned um, making it illegal to have any devices that may modify the legal weapon into an illegal one. Is there legislation on the, on the table for that? You know, um, after the Las Vegas shooting, um, we all kind of came together and said we would, and um, introduce, uh, legislation has been introduced and it's just sitting there. Uh, um, good question. I think we need to, to this, when I go back to Washington, this is intent to find out where it is who's co-sponsoring it. I'm happy to jump on as a co-sponsor uh, onto that. Um, is, it, is it the leadership of the majority party that's not bringing that to the floor? Is it committee leaders? Do you know? Um, I, I will find out. I don't know, but, but I'll find out. Yeah. I think it's a little bit late, but how do you feel about these, you know, multi-bullet assault type weapons? Or should they be available? Because that's been, one of the biggest problems why so many people can be killed yeah. in such a short time. Um, I'll, I'll tell you uh, kind of a soft answer. How's that? Um, I'm willing to have and the dialogue. How do people get those? Do yeah. they get approval? This young man in Florida had approval. He was supposedly did a background check on that. That's really sketchy. It seems yeah. like to me, but okay. okay. So I think to be fair, I, um, we need to have the debate about everything. Right, and I don't have the answer to that question. Um, but I'm willing to talk about it. I'm willing to talk about age uh, restrictions um, and, and other things. Um, How did you get that done? As, as I understand it, does anybody know specific, let me just tell you what I understand. This is only from a few news reports, is that he purchased it legally. Um, so it is legal to do those high power? It is. In Florida, an 18-year-old yeah. can buy that kind of weapon, There's but they can't go to a bar and get a drink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they so, use the argument you can go in the military at that age, but you can run to yeah. specific, you know, uses for it. Yeah. So I think um, I think what I'm advocating for is let's not be afraid of that discussion. Let's have all of these discussions, um, and I think also what I'm saying is. Those of us that, that love the Second Amendment shouldn't be afraid of the dialogue. And um, let's look at also, I, I want to make sure we're looking at facts too. And, and let's spend some time and energy researching. We have so much data right now. L let's look at what's causing them. Let me go here and then right here. I, I've had this discussion about guns with my mother who's never touched a gun and is deathly afraid of them. And a girl that didn't quite understand how we talk about education, and education is so powerful, but we can't talk about guns in school. And really I have, a, my dad gave me a brochure from the 50s, the NRA published, how to set up a shooting program in your high school. And it used to be that, I mean, 50 years ago, you'd have a gun rack in your truck, you'd drive to school, and after school you'd go shooting in the field, on the pheasants or whatever. But now we've become so afraid of guns that we won't even talk about what they are, how they work, 
how to keep them safe. We have sex education in school, why don't we have gun education in school? My mom grew up on a farm and she talked about the fact that there were always uh, rifles and shotguns by the front door because they wanted to get the coyote, right? And there was never an accident because they taught a lot of respect. I'll get right to you, but let me make one comment. One of the things I read, I've been reading a lot online following the comments and things, is that um, almost all of these are connected to a suicide. Uh, not 100%, but, but all of them are. Well, we need to spend some time on that. Um, and um, so that's why I think it's just really multifaceted uh, as well. I'm going to segue off her comment about because I fail to see why any civilian would need a military grade assault weapon. The Supreme Court has held that the Second Amendment is not unlimited. Let's face it, when it was written, those kind of weapons did not exist. So to say and what people go to immediately is mental health. I work in the mental health field. If you look at what we are the only country that has this problem, we are just us on that. So to say it's a mental health problem or all the rest, it's a gun problem. Well, um, let me say this. We don't want to resolve this here this morning. There are There is a very good logical other side of that, but I think it's fine to have that debate. You mentioned research and data. We don't have good data on it because Congress forbade the CDC in 1996 from doing any research on gun violence, and that has been in place since then. Yeah. And I, I think it's time to look at all of that. But I, I will say, and I, I don't want anybody to break out in hives here, we are in Spanish Fork. Um, there, are, there, are logical, yeah, there are logical arguments, and I, I don't want to have that debate here. I'm simply saying, as a country, it's time to have the discussion. Um, Yes, sir. So before I, the first thing that came to my mind is how did an 18 year old get that type of a weapon? And then I learned a few more facts about the fact that he did buy it. It wasn't given to him by a guardian or a parent. He did have a mental health issue. And he'd been apparently. accessing the system. Apparently. So you can't say that that was one that fell through the cracks. The second question that came to my mind was how did he get into the school? Do we have enough security in our schools? I, the security that's at my school in Springfield is there's a sign that says check in. Yeah. Um, our other schools around the country have more security than we have. We need to spend more money on resources for security so our schools. This we is, need to have volunteers do it. Yeah, I, um, I think I have a little bit, not tons, but a little bit of experience in this area. And um, our schools in Utah are amazingly vulnerable, not just to shooters, um, to uh, parents that would come without permission and take a child that's not theirs, uh, to all sorts of things. I think in many ways the state um, ought to be looking at this issue. Um, the school perimeters, fences, um, it, it's almost impossible to secure a building with so many entries, um, near impossible, and so we've got to talk about you know, um, fencing, and as we rebuild schools, uh, you know, single points of entry or, or limited points of entry, um, we we've got um, we've got um, many people who are qualified and would volunteer uh, to be security at schools, um, and you know, those are the types of things. In addition to guns, in addition to mental illness, this is a whole new category that we've hardly even discussed. Of are we securing schools so that if all these other things break down, this is our last failed stop that they, they can't get in. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, we, got, we need to look at security. Here in Spanish Ford, we have a program where we have an officer assigned to different schools. Uh, it's helped paid by Spanish Ford City. It's helped paid by the school district. For those officers to go into the school and help a lot of times with the elementary school so those kids can get a feel that hey, the officers there they're comfortable them, and, yeah. but they're also there to help protect yeah you know but i know in provo it's probably very similar we don't really send them with the primary mission of protecting exactly and, and that may need to change let me go right behind you cheryl and then up to cheryl and then right here i just i'm, I'm probably a full spanish work i love my guns but i recognize there's a problem here uh, i bought a lot of guns and i always have to fill out that form and the form has questions like have you ever been judged to be mentally defective I mean, even if I had that, I wouldn't say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then there's no way they check that anyway. Uh, and then they did the background check on me. 
which I always pass, and all that says I've never done anything yet. And so, you know, it seems to me that everything we've done so far is just saying that, uh, okay, the gun dealer is not protected because he asked you the questions. It doesn't do anything real to, to keep him. I mean, the kid, he's 18, he doesn't have much of a background to share. You know, he's not, of course he hasn't done anything yet. And then he goes out tomorrow and look what he just did. You know, that, that's a big part of the problem is that we, we go through a lot of steps that don't really do anything other than point fingers after the fact rather than prevent the fact from coming forward. Uh, whatever we do needs to be able to address some of those issues as well. I think there's a lot of consensus with gun owners and non-gun owners that the mentally ill should not have firearms. And so boring down in on that and uh, what are we doing to prevent that and or is it just feel good stuff like fill out this form or do we need to be more specific? Uh, all are really good questions. So the president? Let me, I promised over here and then back there, yeah, sorry. We should, maybe we should have done the last half hour of guns because we may not get to anything else, but that's okay. If that's what you want to talk about. I just wanted to put a shout out for our um, Spanish Fort Police because they've been proactive in going into each individual school and meeting with the faculty and addressing that particular school, what we need to do and what we need to be aware of in our school and training us as a faculty how to handle a lockdown situation in our school in each room so that if my children are in PE or in computers, I know what the particular parameters are and what the safest route is. We have a program in place of a whistle and and have and, and several of us have phones in our room with the code to make a complete uh, all call. And so I we are educating ourselves on that. But for me the bigger issue is I take my five year olds and I am teaching them habits that will help them communicate with each other learn how to deal with differences. My deal is here, this is a kid who either didn't feel loved or felt like he had been wrong or felt like he had nowhere to go. So how are we addressing those issues? And so I'm teaching my three five-year-olds how to greet each other, how to talk to each other. And for me, that's what Congress needs to address. Yesterday when I was up there and they were proposing a bill about a preschool program, and it was all about helping keep kids out of the special ed by giving them the tools they need. Why aren't we giving children the tools they need to communicate and work out differences? That's where it is we, for me. We just need a whole lot more teachers like Cheryl. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I'm a, I'm a student here at Maple Mountain High School, which is just down the road. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I don't know, just to like go back a couple steps, we took a couple steps before I was raised my hand for a little bit, but I just, you recently just uh, stated that it's, it should be more of a national thing, but I, I don't want to just like sound disrespectful, uh, if I curse, but I feel like this is like where like change happens, where we have discussions with you, so therefore that we can all know. Because sure, it's easy to say that oh, it's a national thing, but if we don't debate it at a local level, then there's no way to debate it in the, on a national level. So we, I, I just personally want to hear what your stance is as your representative for us. Were you here um, when we started? What was that? Were you here when we started? No, I was not. Okay, I read a, a, a thing and I'll share it with you afterwards. Oh yeah, was it, was it the letter? Yeah. Or, yeah. So you were here for that. Yeah, yeah that's we my stance. That. But like, on like, not only that, but like what sort of exact legislation are you willing to like sponsor or propose in the coming months? Okay, so let me, um, let me take off a point that you said early on and then answer that specific question. Um, I really do believe, um, that it is a mistake to point simply to the federal government alone uh, on this. Uh, this is a great discussion for state leaders, for city leaders. Uh, school security is probably far better addressed on a state level than it is on a federal level. Uh, some of the issues that Cheryl was bringing up is, is these are your local school boards, right? Um, setting these tones and these curriculums and things like that. And, um, in a way, what's been wrong with the argument, I think, in the past is this, well, if you would only consider gun legislation, we wouldn't have this problem. Or if you just stop blaming guns and, and realize it's mental illness, we wouldn't have this problem. Neither of those are good answers, right? And um, it, it's, it's a little bit, in my mind, like trying to stop a terrorist. I mean, if you're law enforcement and you have to stop a terrorist, it's the needle in the haystack thing, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. The number of ways that somebody could attack a school if they wanted to are legion. 
And, and so if we're not talking about the actual security in a school, that's a huge mistake. Uh, if we're not talking about what we're teaching our kids, that's a huge mistake. If we're not talking about which legislation specifically uh, should we be passing, that's a mistake. If we're not talking about mental illness and its impact and, and how are we filtering out those who, who are getting firearms, that's a mistake. Now to answer your specific question, uh, there is um, a, a bill that uh, we've jumped on as a co-sponsor that is to fund schools ability to teach and train warning signs and, 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 and make sure that teachers are qualified, that administrators are qualified and law enforcement are, are qualified to pick up on these signs. Um, I've made a commitment that I'll, I'll dig into the bump stock um, legislation and figure out where that is. Um, I'm happy, I support that and I'm happy to jump on that. And um, then I'm, I don't know other specifics beyond that other than I'm willing to happy in. So raise your hands and I'm, let's just give you a number. We'll go one, two, three, four, and I'm gonna, we, we're gonna go to those who haven't asked first, five, yeah, and then we'll go. And I've lost track of who's won, so just jump in. If, <laughs> d yeah. So another question I have is, is just over, you know, yesterday we learned that the FBI dropped the ball yeah. on investigating this individual. And I'm wondering, is, are we, should we not be putting our expectation in having them do this? Does it need to be more of a local, <clears throat> Does there need to be more communication between the local uh, law enforcement and, and the FBI? And maybe the, maybe, the, maybe the local law enforcement should be really the ones that are following up on these leads and um, I think to people? I think that it takes a coordinated local uh, um, effort, but in many cities and towns, they don't have the resources, have the resources. or the expertise. And, and you've got to rely on, on some national uh, law enforcement to help. Um, I'm, I'm anxious to learn more about it. I, I've heard what you're referring to, and I'm anxious to learn more about it. Um, I think that we're, we're constantly uh, walking this fine line. We're, we're dealing right now with some of the FISA restraints and things like that on the federal government to eavesdrop and to, to spy on not only U.S. citizens but non-U.S. citizens. And we balance all the time this privacy versus um, safety. And um, do we want to authorize law enforcement to go just a little bit deeper uh, into personal lives um, when they see something that is a, a warning sign or a symptom? Um, I don't know enough about what happened here to be able to speak to it, but I think it's a question to ask. Um, and then make sure we're balancing that with, okay, we're, we do give up privacy and security. None of us are really crazy about people monitoring our social media Right, and then making decisions on that, but that's how you find well, these guys. Don't fly this. Why don't we have lists that are communicated between local government, federal government, and schools? Hey, these individuals you need to watch out for them. They, they could be a problem. Well, I certainly think if we can identify the warning signs, and we and we see those in somebody, we've got to have appropriate response to those. Who was yes, sir? Yeah. So I guess. As a teacher, uh, one of the concerns I have is that sometimes we allow what the perceived magnitude of a problem stopping us from doing yeah. anything. And that's what I hear right now is specifically around school safety. Um, you know, we talk about, oh, it would be so hard to secure these buildings. Well, I've worked for 35 years and I've never not worked in a secure building. I've always had to badge in. I went up to the state capitol a couple weeks ago. And in any of the areas where the representatives go, they have to badge through to open the doors. I don't get why this is such a difficult problem. You know, to put these kinds of security systems on a school, to have somebody standing there at the door that badges the kids in as they come in. I mean, it doesn't seem like as big a problem as we're making it, and we spend more time talking about it than doing it. And that's what so it it reminds me a lot of airports where after 9-11 we gave up a lot of our freedoms, right, it, specifically at airports, like, you know, we're, we're, we're searched more we're, and things like that. And I'm not sure society has come to grips yet that uh, Moab Elementary uh, needs to badge kids as they come in. And I'm not saying they do or they don't, but I'm, I'm just not sure that they've come to terms with that. Now. My guess is if you're in a, a very dense populated city, they've come to terms with it already and are doing some of those things uh, in those cities. 
And so I think we need to ask that question of ourselves. Um, in, in Provo, Provo's a little different than, than a blanding. Um, are we to that point in, in Provo, uh, where we need to start badging in uh, everybody that comes in? Um, I will just tell you, as somebody who's dealt in the security world, there's a lot of other low-hanging fruit that we're not doing. Single point of entry, um, so somebody can see who's coming in. Um, that doesn't take away much freedom, right? I mean, there are, there are things that we're just not doing between badging and metal detectors and, and things like that. Yes, Mayor. I, of course, I'm the Mayor of Casey, but be proud of that. In other life, I was a police officer for 31 years. Uh, you know, I think there's some common sense things that we can do that we're not doing. Uh, I don't think that I heard the, the comment. I don't want our schools to be a prison either. That sent the wrong message to the, to the children there and, and you know, unsettles them as far as their, their learning processes. So I think there's some, some common sense things, such, like you say, single entry in many of the schools, uh, at least over in Basin, I'm sure here, all the doors are locked except for the front door. And that can be a signal point of entry, but then some of the office spaces are off to the side and they can't really control it. At that point... Who's coming through the single point, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, and I believe that these people that want to do this, to a certain extent, they want to succeed. And the way they define success is kill people. So I think they're going to go somewhere where they can succeed. And if there's not, a, say, an armed guard there, uh, that's where they're going. If there is an armed guard, they'll, they'll, they won't go. They'll go somewhere else. Uh, so I'm curious as a police officer, and, and we've got a school teacher and a police officer, what do you think about uh, letting teachers carry firearms? You know, that becomes a little bit of a problem. It's, it's the uh, uh, police officers have to be very, very familiar with the, when they go in. With the staff. And they, it's critical that they know who is there, recognize them. That's a good and point. So I wouldn't, on its face, I wouldn't necessarily send a red flag, but there's some things that has to be worked out. Yeah, it, it, you wouldn't want to be the teacher that's mistaken for the gunman. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. You wouldn't want to be the teacher who mistakenly Somebody yeah. Well, and that's why I don't think you ever get there without serious training and qualifications. Um, and it's not for everybody, right? But we, we let our pilots carry firearms now for that same reason. I'm going to stay with the count, help me, st and then we'll go pick up the others that. Okay, thank you. And, and I, I just want to make a comment I don't care if you fly or not. As a retired law enforcement officer, a range master, shooting on the shooting range, specifically when it comes to mass shootings, the only way to reduce mass shootings is to reduce a mass shooting weapon. And that's an AR-15, that's extended magazines. When I retired, I was, uh, I had to give up my extended magazines. I had to go back to a normal magazine. I'll do it. And then I have a question for that. Sure, go ahead. Okay, and I know you weren't in office at this time. Um, if you would, just ask me, or tell me how you would have voted. But some six, six and a half months ago, 515 legislators voted to increase sanctions on Russia due to interference from Russia during the elections. 515, uh, veto-proof legislation. Our president has ignored that. How would you vote if you would, if you, if you want to answer? And what, would, what should Congress do at this point in time? Censure, About it. Impeachment? Yeah. Um, I would have voted for the sanctions. That was easy. Um, let me tell you. Um, the difference between what makes sense to do and <laughs> this will sound funny, what Congress does. <laughs> um, you have to understand a, a little bit the way Congress functions. Um, and that is, we don't do anything quickly and whatever we do consumes our attention. And so for instance, immigration right now is consuming everything. Shutdowns have consumed uh, everything. And so we have to, to balance a little bit um, where we're going to spend our time and attention. So while it seems obvious that we should be grumpy with the president, that we should do something about it, it comes at a cost. And it, it's a priority. Uh, and, and in my opinion, that's probably why the Congress right now is going, oh, this ticks us off, but nobody wants to take our eye off immigration right now. Um, and it takes months. You, you don't get anything through Congress quickly. I, I don't believe you mentioned everything from a sanction to an impeachment. I, I think sanction may be appropriate. I don't think this is an impeachable offense myself. Uh, but I do think it would be appropriate for Congress to act. And the only reason I can give you they haven't is this bandwidth issue. 
of priorities. Yes? You said, do you mention um, school security, kind of like an airport, are you thinking full TSA <coughs> type thing at the doors or yeah. single point entry? Um, my gut is, without having studied it, without having seen the facts, that it's not that, but there's just very simple things that we're not doing um, that, that would, um, would uh, discourage and prevent. And um, for instance, we've got in most of our schools, we have a police officer in most of our schools. Well, let me rephrase that, in many of our schools. Um, but they're not sent there to protect. They're sent there to build relationships, to help with small issues and things like that. And is it time to change that paradigm that their office should be by that single point of entry? Um, and they should be relieved by another officer if they leave that spot, right? I mean, there's a huge difference between that and TSA, metal detectors, and, and things like that. So I think I'm advocating the discussion about what level um, should we reach, and um, I'm not sure it's the same for every community. Okay, did we get everybody who I called on? Let me go to those who haven't made a comment, and then we'll go to those of you who have, if they're, okay, here, uh, yes sir, and here, and then back here, okay. Okay, and if, if any of you that haven't made comments, you get to Trump. Uh, is that fair? Right? Where did I go? Okay, yeah. Uh, I actually like the chapter from Puppet too, but my comments were about the teachers caring, teachers caring about students and being teachers carrying guns in schools and things like that. I have a sister in law who's a teacher down in Arizona. And just two days before the shooting, she posted something on social media about a training they had just received, and they're not, by their school district policy, allowed to, to bring weapons to school. Uh, and uh, she said, so it feels like I'm, you know, obviously there's the, the hide first, flee second, or flee first, hide second, I guess, was the, the priority. And then if you have to fight back, use a stapler, you know, right? So the, they want me to bring a stapler to a gunfight. And, and uh, that didn't make much sense to her. And she's not, a, she's not really a gun owner or, or a proponent of guns. But flipping that and saying what Mayor Warrior said, or uh, related to that, uh, I live across the street from Stratford High School. And regularly on Sunday mornings as I leave my house, I see the parking lot full of police cars. And they're in there doing drills. So mm -hmm. I'm grateful that they're doing that. But what if the teachers who, on a voluntary basis, want to participate, we're allowed to participate in the field. I would support that kind of thing. Uh, I would much rather know that there's at least a few people who are trained and understand the situation, and that the police would obviously then be aware of them because they've been in the, the trainings with them. Yeah, this is where, and, and we'll let you comment on this. Go, go ahead, and then I'll comment. Um, currently at Maple Mountain High School, we have several teachers who are carrying, who carrying. weapons. Yeah. Like, okay. I, I personally feel safe in my school due to the fact that I know there's some teachers that you know, carry Exactly. Yeah. The, um, the level difference, let's talk about like who would, who would we want to have a firearm in a school. We're not talking about, um, even me, who's around firearms a lot, um, we're talking about somebody who has been trained, somebody who has, um, that, that you don't have to worry about shooting at the wrong person. Um, I say, it's these people that I, if, if they were invited to some of these trainings that I see happening. Yeah. Um, if, go ahead. Not every time new teachers come, but we have invited over the years to, to, to introduce them at least to, to the, the possibilities and to watch law enforcement go through what, what law enforcement goes through. So that process is an ongoing process. I don't say that it's a finished process, but teachers it, are involved. It'd be interesting to randomly go, okay, you haven't asked questions, so we'll go right over here. Go ahead. Yeah, and I, and I would say maybe maybe right, Bill, too, and that, that at least encourages that, and to and po possibly, yeah. how should we say, direct funding that way. It, it intrigues me. We do it on airplanes, and I actually built ranges where pilots train with those firearms. I know what training they go through. They don't hand a firearm to just anybody, um, and you can't hand a firearm just to any teacher. But think about, would you feel comfortable if your kid's school had two or three uh, teachers in there that were trained? Maybe they're ex-former police officers, maybe they're former military, maybe it's just a passion to them, uh, and they're trained, it's, it's free, right? It's not bad. Okay, we're gonna go, we're trying to go with, yeah. And I, and I have seen you over here, I'll come, yeah. I'd like to get on another topic. 
I actually, I think that's, we spent 40 minutes on this. Let's do that. Let's hop to some other topics. If, is everybody okay with that? Yeah. In an election year where, you know, especially the House of Representatives are, have to run every two years, how can we get some kind of a compromise with this DACA and security? Yeah. It just seems to make common sense so to me that we increase security, at least, you know, modestly, at the same time we're protecting these kids. I've known some of these kids. They came here when they were just little kids, and now... They're trying to get scholarships to college, and they sometimes can't qualify. I worked in a program trying to help kids. And so, you know, a volunteer. And so yeah. we, we need to have something. That we Let can me give you problem. what I believe is the lay of the land on immigration. Um, I was um, saddened that the Senate couldn't get a bill through last week. Um, I was optimistic that they actually would uh, do a better job than the House. Um, I think the House will get a bill through. I'm, I'm warning all of you right now, it's pretty stinking conservative. Um, so it won't pass the Senate. So it won't pass the Senate. But let me tell you what I think w w would be a, a good situation and a healthy situation, is for the House to get the bill through that they can get through, for the Senate to get the bill through that they can get through. They go to what's called conference. Um, people sit down and say, Okay, to get through the House, it's got to have this. Well, to get through the Senate, it's got to have this. And they actually do a pretty remarkable job of pulling those two bills into one. And that's what I would like to see happen. And, and I've told people, I'm going to support what comes out of the House, even though it will probably have some measures that I don't think are perfect, because that moves the process on. And the problem with what the Senate did is it stopped the process. And now, I don't think they've completely left uh, immigration. And as a matter of fact, I'm sure they haven't. But if they get a bill through, even though imperfect, this is kind of the beauty of the system. It has to get through both houses. And what you don't want to do is to stop that momentum and that, 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 um, that process, even though it's an imperfect bill. So what comes before the House will likely be what we call the Goodlatte bill. It's Chairman Goodlatte from Virginia, who has a bill that um, it's pretty conservative. And, and those of you who are a little bit more moderate, it will bother you. Um, but if that gets through, you don't need to overstress that because it still has to get through the Senate before it becomes law. And then you get to see this process coming together of the Senate, which by its nature, because of the 60 votes, is going to be more moderate. And um, the House is going to be a little bit more conservative. And, and I'm hopeful both houses can get a bill through uh, and then that process can come together. I believe what you'll see, if that can happen in the final bill, is relief for the DACA, the Dreamers. I don't know exactly what it will look like. Right? It could take several shapes, but at the base of it, it would be um, a relief for them from the uncertainty. It will have some kind of border security in it. If it's going to get through this, it will have border security. I think the discussion about border security is great. I don't think you have to have that saying, we're funding a wall from sea to shining sea. I think you can, you can make a case for border security, and I don't think we should be talking about our southern border only. I think we're talking about ports and airports and, and just generally securing our borders. People have pretty well acknowledged that something's going to have to have both of those components. There are other components that are extremely important that we fix while we're here. Our uh, seasonal worker system is totally broken, and we need to fix that. And the, one of the things the Goodlat Bill has that I like is they have spent a lot of time with farmers, ranchers, dairymen, uh, to make sure that we're fixing that very, very broken system so that they're able to match the needs with good qualified people who, who want to fulfill those, those jobs. Uh, there is another uh, aspect that I hope gets addressed, and that's our highly skilled workers that are coming in on visas. That's broken as well. So my hope is that we, we use this momentum and this opportunity to fix multiple layers that are broken uh, with the immigration system. Utah came out a number of years ago with the Utah Compact. Um, I want you to know I support that compact. I think it's, it's, it's wise. The only problem with the compact is it doesn't really tell us how to do it. It gives us more of the principles um, th that we want to enforce. And I want you to know I, I support that compact. Um, okay, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'll go to you. I'm just checking to make sure that, okay, here and end up here, yeah. Um, I haven't read this, so I'd, I'd like if you could tell me if you know how to do it. Okay, how does when it comes to term, to interim clearances, security clearances, who is responsible to say 
you have an interim clearance. If the FBI says there's problems. You're talking about the White House? Yeah. Okay, so we're off immigration? Yep. Okay. So Was yours so immigration? Yes. Let me come here and then we'll go. Right. Sorry, sorry, I just want to. Okay. Just we'll, let's, we'll go right to you after we're off uh, immigration. Yeah. Segue off what you said. On your previous two town halls, we've talked a lot about immigration. That's the two that I've been to. And you said at one point that you, there's been a lot of push for just a clean DACA bill. Just a clean, just pass the DREAM Act and take care of the rest of it later. And you said you wanted to kind of have it all in one package. It's looking less and less likely like that's going to be possible. So if we can get a clean DREAM Act up there for a vote, will you support that? Um, let me first of all say I don't think it is getting less likely. I think you're, you're seeing the, the inside of the factory sausage making happening right now in immigration. I haven't given up on it. Um, I want relief for the dreamers. Um, I've never really f got to the place in my mind where if that's the only choice I have, what would I do? I can guarantee you that won't pass. It, it just won't. Just on immigration and all that, uh, you know, one of our issues here, you know, we've had people that come to the United States that want to become citizens, but it is very difficult. It it's almost takes 10 years for them to do that. And they have to, it's very expensive and all that. I don't think when my immigrants, yeah. ancestors came, that they were Ellis Island for 10 years waiting. Yeah, to get let me tell you what I don't like. Is there some way that we can speed up that process yeah. to eliminate, you know, and make it so they can live the American dream and become citizens and start paying taxes and be vital people to the country? Um, one of the things I don't like about the Goodlatte bill is it actually reduces overall numbers. Um, and I think it's proven that immigrants make great contributions to our, com to our country and that we need to find that right spot of, of, of people that would contribute and pay taxes and love our country and contribute to the country and um, th that has not yet been determined in the bills uh, that are ahead of us. But we'll go here and I haven't forgotten you, we'll come back to you. Uh, I don't think anybody disagrees that immigrants are good for our country. My wife's parents came here in the early 60s from Mexico, six months start to finish, and they were approved and here legally with a visa and everything else. The, the issue, I think, is we've thrown our doors open to everybody, saying everybody come, we want everybody. We've got criminals coming in, we've got people with no skills coming in. If we could fix the way that, and <coughs> fix, trying to fix Washington as a, an insane concept in the beginning, but trying to streamline that process so we know who's coming. It's a simple process. We're choosing who gets the privilege to live in this, in, in this great country, and we're picking those who, with skills, who are going to contribute to society. We would be in real trouble without immigrants. Um, there are many in Congress that feel that exact way, and that's one of the reasons I say a clean drill dreamer bill will not pass, because many people are saying, we only do this if we are better at measuring um, who's coming in uh, and are they contributors to our country? Yes. John, I'm Larry Serenzi. We've Hello, Larry. A few times. Yes. My concern about the illegal immigration came home to me about seven years ago. I get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning from the hospital with the police where my son had been attacked in St. George. They were at a party, three cars drive up. We'll call it um, ethnic groups, get out of the car, and they all feel there's something wrong. My son and his buddies are strong as heck. They are, but they said, there's just something wrong. We want to get out of here. So they were backing out. The guy pretended to be drunk, smashed him through the window, broke his jaw. Found out there were three other people. One was an attorney down there, his son. Another was a kid just playing basketball. It went through exactly the same thing within 18 hours. So I went to some of my military friends with intel just complaining, not, I, I'm not complaining, worried, right? Son's wired, jaws all wired shut. Uh, he could have been killed. Just a little difference in where that punch was. Well, it turns out through my military friends who found out it was a drug cartel trying to open up Utah to become the slave capital of the Western United States of which we've seen some of that stuff. Sean Reyes has put away some of these folks, <clears throat> and it actually has happened. I tried to go to law enforcement. Nobody would listen. Arturo Morales Lawn explained. Do you, do you know Arturo? No. Off the Republican 
steering committee. He explained to me what happens is when you have illegal people here, and I'm not saying they're bad people. This is, has nothing to do with, with any of that. Um, when they're here, the drug cartel knows exactly where their families are. They come knock on the door and they say, we have this thing for you to do. They always say no. Then they say, your grandmother lives in Guadalajara. You're whatever over here. You don't do it, we take them out. And that's how they build this force to end up with a sex slave situation like we've, you know, the things that have come up in West Valley and such. I'm just concerned about protecting all of us, as well as the illegal immigrants, you know, from the, being put in that situation where they are forced to do things they didn't even want to do. So I, I just ask that we consider that in this border security issue. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not saying we throw everybody out, we don't go, but we've got to come up with a way to protect our, our so people as I, well. So I would just emphasize uh, the point that I made here is there are many of my uh, peers that feel that exact same way and, and won't let something move through unless there's a border security component to it. Let's hop off immigration and go to another delightful topic that's <laughs> <laughs> right uh, here. All right, I'll try to rephrase it a little bit there. We have, okay. we have a president that cannot pass could not pass a security clearance due to his immorality, his questionable connections with Russia, with money laundering. It's all questionable. I'm not going to say he's guilty. It's questionable. Okay, we have uh, interim security clearances being allowed in the White House, which allows the chief, I don't know, he's not the chief of staff, whoever Portman was, he, he gets the folders. He hands it off to the president. He can open it up. He can look at it. He is subject to blackmail, just as anybody else is in the White House. And who, who allows an interim uh, security clearance? Who, who says yes or no? Yeah, I don't have the answer to that. You don't? Uh, no. Um, this, for a lot of us, just came up as an issue as Rob Porter, you know, the story unfolded. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask and see. I don't know who, if, if that's a, simply an administrative thing, that that's the FBI. Uh, and their responsibility, or, or one of our other agencies. I, I'm, Could we put it off on the executive office? As I understand it, it's the administration. It, it, probably, yeah, it probably is. Now, Congress, what, what Congress has the ability, and we kind of talked about this before with the sanction, we can step in and make laws on really anything we want, right? But is, is, does it make sense for us to step in and say, now we're taking this over, right, as a Congress? Are we really qualified? Are we, are we really good? I think. Um, the situation with Rob Porter has raised a lot of eyebrows and, and will cause a lot of questions. It's kind of an answer. I don't have an answer for you. If I, it's not that I'm avoiding you, I just don't know the answer. Yeah, I like that. You're new, right? <laughs> 12 weeks, yeah. So you don't know the answer? Yeah, I don't have any problem <laughs> telling you what I don't know. It. Yeah. So earlier, I congratulated you on your vote on. Oh, let's talk budget, yes. But my question is maybe explain to everybody why uh, the House has passed 10 or 12 appropriations bills over the last year, sent them to the Senate, and the Senate has done nothing about it. Is that simply because of the 60 vote rule? Is the 60 vote rule a procedural thing or is that a constitutional thing? Why does the Senate not take up legislation you've passed? Great question. I actually know something about this. so. <laughs> uh, um, and, and let me give a little bit more background, if not everybody understands what you just said. So um, there are 12 appropriation bills that Congress should pass for the budget. Um, last fall, the House loves to brag that we did our job. We passed these 12 appropriation bills and sent them to the Senate. The Senate did nothing with them and sat on them, and that's why we got in a situation where we needed the continuing resolutions to keep the government open because they had not acted. And there are, um, now let me hold that thought for a minute and let's talk about how the Senate is different than the House. Um, the Senate functions on rules um, that are not law, they're rules, that says that you have to have 60 votes of the 100 to bring something to a vote. So that effectively says you can't pass anything unless 60 senators agree with it because you'll never even get it to a vote where you would only need 51 to pass it, but you can't get it there unless 60 senators agree to that. And um, many would point to that as why they have not been able to move these bills. 
we hear all the time, and I even said it before as a candidate, is, well, wait a minute, Republicans control the House, the Senate, and the presidency. We should be able to just get lots done. My new reality is we don't control the Senate. You just don't when it takes 60 votes to get something done. So the Senate, and then the, you also have to understand, this was new to me too, is the personality of the Senate is very different than the House. The House, <laughs> we've got one of our, uh, my deputy chief of staff came over from the Senate and he's constantly amazed at how we, the personality is different in the House. We're fast, we're reactive, uh, we, we just pass bills and throw them over at the Senate. And the Senate is this slow, methodical, drive you crazy, um, body. That's just their personality. So you add to that the 60 vote rule. So they don't even bring it up for debate about what to do and not, and not get the 60 votes. It's just kind of their personality. It drives us nuts. What we're saying in the House is we'll vote on it and if you don't like it, send it back what you don't like. And this is the process, right? They go back and forth until you finally get a bill that can pass. They don't even act on it. They don't even vote on it. And that's been very frustrating to the House. So yes, um, now, what I can't tell you is if the 60-vote rule was there, would they have passed it? You see the margin is so slim right now that one or two senators give them the inability to pass it. You saw that with health care. Uh, so it was a very partisan issue. They still couldn't pass it uh, uh, with the 50 votes. So um, that's the dynamic. And then that sets up this, okay, the government's going to run out of money. And so you saw, I've been in Congress 12 weeks. I voted three times on continuing resolutions to keep the government open. I hate them. I mean, they're always lose-lose, right? One of them was for three weeks. We knew we couldn't fix anything in three weeks, and we still voted on a three-week continuing resolution. Just sets up the next problem. Well, imagine our federal workers who are going, what's going to happen in three weeks, right? And so we throw them into a tizzy, um, and, and, and I don't think most of us realize the impact on morale, the impact on productivity, um, even when we get close to a shutdown, they start canceling trainings and, and all sorts of things that end up costing the government a lot of money. So we got caught in this cycle of continuing resolutions. Layer on top of that, what they call the CAPS deal. Uh, six years ago, they started um, an agreement where they would come together and agree to a cap on military spending and discretionary spending. The last two rounds, they raised those caps. It's why Speaker Boehner got thrown out. When he raised the caps two years ago, that's, what's got what him, that's what got him kicked out. I'm going from memory. Corey, you may remember, it's 20 something million dollars he raised those caps. Uh, Tw that, 20 billion, I'm sorry. Uh, I was like 20 million. No, no, 20 billion, right, yeah. That's, <laughs> he raised them like 20 billion, and that got some Republicans so mad he got thrown out. So, Going on in this dialogue about continuing resolutions and, and appropriations and everything was this CAPS dialogue. And um, Speaker Ryan knew he had to get Democratic buy-in because he couldn't get the 60 votes to get a budget deal. So he kept referring in, in, to us as, oh, I gotta get these CAP deals, gotta get these CAP deals as we were doing these continuing resolutions. All of a sudden he came back and said, well, I've got the CAP deals and they're massive. Um, and um, uh, that's when, in my opinion, they, they made them so um, hard to turn down that many of my colleagues voted for them. So how do they make them turn, hard to turn down? They threw in all of the disaster relief. So if you're in Florida, Texas, and California, and you don't vote for this, you go back to your states and say, I, I turned down disaster relief. Uh, they threw in military, uh, all of us and this is bipartisan, we love the military, we know the military has to be funded at the appropriate levels. Well, by putting that in there, there are many defense hawks who said, I have to do this, I have to, I have to vote for this bill. And then they threw a, enough in that the Democrats liked it, so they didn't need uh, Republican votes because they now had both parties. So we call that bipartisan. There's good bipartisan and bad bipartisan. Does that make sense? I mean, we want more bipartisanism in, uh, in, back there, but this was an example to me of, of bad bipartisanism where it just took these spending caps way too high. And, um, and, that, and that's how that was approved. And uh, thank you for pointing that out. I did not vote for it. I, I could not in good conscience. I, I love the military. I had previously voted for disaster relief. I supported that, but I couldn't vote for this 
total package um, that was just too high, that we don't have a plan. It had been very different if we'd said, here's our plan to, to control this. We don't have a plan. Um, on a different topic, this is now, I don't know how many town halls you've <laughs> a lot since you took office. Yeah. And I want to just totally commend you, Thank you. For, for doing this. I mean, it's seriously. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you. You are a remarkable, you stand out from the crowd from almost everyone else in Congress and in particular among the Utah delegation. Um, we haven't seen our senators hold town halls like this. You know I'm not going to comment on this. I, I, <laughs> that's, that's totally fine. We, we, but, but there seems to be a fear among the rest of the Utah delegation of holding in-person town halls like this. And I hope that you will communicate back to your colleagues in the delegation that it's okay. So let me, yeah, I will comment on that. And thank you, and thank you for the compliment, all of you. And then I will in turn compliment you. You're here on a Saturday morning. Seriously, that's. I, I counted them up though, John. This is, this is number 13 since you took off. So. In, in, in about 12 weeks. So we're averaging about one a week. We'll do three today. Uh, were you counting the two still coming? And you're, right. were the, were you, did those 13 count the two still no, coming? Yeah. Um, oh, all that, no, 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 that's 13 going past, and you'll be... So there's 15, 15 at the end of the day. 15, 16, 17, so 18 um, or so by next weekend. So let me also compliment not only you, but those who have come to these meetings. They could have been hot. Last week, we had Bears Ears. We haven't even touched on that, but there's some very strong feelings. Um, but people came to that um, calm, calm. Um, and, and that set up for me an environment that was uh, safe, if that makes sense. Um, I, I credit my experience as a mayor for my willingness to do this. Um, as hard as some of these questions are, you stand up in front of a crowd where you're putting a road in their backyard. And that, is that not hard? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? When you want to raise property. Yeah, you want to raise property tax? Um, that makes a vote on a budget look easy. Um, and I actually think that's why this is comfortable for me, is that for eight years, I stood up in front of some, some really frustrated residents. And I learned that if you'll be honest, if you'll um, respect them, that you don't get into these uh, bad situations. So I think my best um, answer to you on encouraging others is um, the word will get out. Right, they'll see that, you, that they're happening and they're successful, and um, I would, of course, encourage them to do them. Um, yeah, it's it's a lot easier to disagree if you've had a chance to sit and let me explain myself and feel like you were heard, um, both sides. So thank you. Um, we've got maybe uh, ten more minutes. Um, have we have we not has somebody not asked a question that came here with a burning question? Or is there a topic that we haven't touched that you would you would want to make sure we touch? Yes, sir. Uh, to go back to immigration briefly, um, I became first aware of this issue when we married uh, in California. It's part station with the Marine Corps there. Uh, it, but every decade, this has never been fixed. And I can see the national frustration grow from that time. Uh, so I'm fairly new in, in, in that area. Um, it is uh, more specific to me where an extended family member of mine, it took him, I can't remember if it was 10 or 12 years, his wife in from Chile. And so they were separated. And it cost him 20 to 30,000 trying to pay the bills over and over again to readdress it. So it has been a long term concern. I have another extended family member who, uh, through contract with a commercial company, is working for the immigration office travels two hours from where he lives just to get there every day one way. But his function is to help write programs to help reduce the size of paperwork, he says, or comparably the size of uh, the Statue of Liberty, trying to get that down so it can be handled. But I only bring that up as a comment. Thank you for addressing it. Thank you for looking at it. There is efforts to help rectify this terrible wrong and, and abuse of the people that are trying yeah. to come here correctly, um, and yet at the same time, I spend 30 odd years with the Marine Corps, I recognize that there is a civ problems along the border. We have some really bad guys that really want to do harm. 
Um, and so I see the frustration grow nationally. I see the holes in it. Uh, but thank you for addressing it. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll just make a comment on that. It's one of the reasons, his comment is one of the reasons that I'll probably end up supporting an imperfect immigration bill. Because um, if we wait for perfection, it's not going to happen. And, and so the question is, is it, uh, is, is, I'm trying to think of my gram grammatically how to say this, is it, is the imperfection acceptable? Um, or, or does it cross the line right where nothing is better? And right now, we desperately need something. It has gone on decades, and politicians have stayed away from this. Every once in a while, they get close, and we are closer. Everybody back there agrees we are closer than we have ever been to getting an answer to this. And um, I encourage those, um, and, and I've told some of the dreamers in my district, look, you better stay close to me, because as this starts to evolve, I'm going to have to make decisions about what to support and what not to support. I've got to know what your priorities are because you're not, you may not get all of them, right? And at some point, have we crossed a line where I can't support it and we get nothing? Um, or do we support something and say, we'll take it. It's, it, it, it's not perfect, but we'll take it. But Cheryl, and then we'll come right here. So. Okay, I'm gonna just move off of this for just a okay. minute. So I would like to know your vision for education. As a teacher, of course, we're all a little afraid of Betsy DeVoe and her <laughs> threats to pull federal funding from our schools. and. I would just like to know, because that would be devastating for our schools and for educating our children and providing them with the special things we have. So what is your vision and where do you see education going? So let me address um, what federal funding really is. <coughs> is. Federal funding is your money that we take. We keep a lot of it and give some back. So I would support um, the reduction of federal funding if we stopped taking it from the states so that they could take 100% of it and, and do it in a, a much better way. And that is one of the, the, the problems with the situation that's kind of confronted of us is, well, do we want the federal, you know, do we want to eliminate the Department of Education? And that implies that everything that you're currently getting from them you no longer get, which I could see would be very threatening. If I had a magic wand and could say, we won't take it to begin with, we'll let the state collect it, and I, I don't know what the exact percentage of it is, but we keep a lot of it that just is wasted. When you send a dollar back to Washington, it, you know, 50 cents is coming back to you, um, and it's coming with conditions. Now, the state would likely put some conditions on it, but A, there would be a lot less, and they'd be far more in tune with Utah's needs than what we put on it. Let me give you, a, I'm gonna pivot a little bit to infrastructure, but use it to make a point. As a mayor, I'm listening to this dialogue about the federal government saying, hey, we're gonna change our ratio and give states 20% uh, to help encourage them to do projects. What's the problem with us doing a federal project and taking 20%? Well, and it also, how much does it cost us when it's a federal project? More. Twice. More. Yeah, I mean, what would, you, what would you guess is, I mean, when we do, so we did I-15, we didn't take a dollar of federal money, and we completed that hundreds of millions of dollars below bu budget. The minute you take one dollar of federal money, your project increases well in excess of the 20% that they would give us, well in excess, probably at least double that. Um, and so I've got this, Cheryl, I've got this bias against the federal government, um, taking your money and then f making you feel uh, like they're very generous when they hand it back. Is that the rules? Is that it's it's, it's a combination, so we have to pay Davis-Bacon wages. Uh, it's, uh, a lot of EPA we're still subject to, but it's, it's a, a big part of it is wages and other regulations that they impose on this when it's a federal project instead of a state project. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go cold turkey and take Department of Education away, if I, even if I had a magic wand, but I'd sure like to phase them out and phase in uh, more state. Uh, uh, yes, and let's take this one and then one last, and the, who, who still has a question? And then we'll go back here, yes. I got an easy one for you. Okay. Oh, as, thank as, goodness. As, uh, everybody in this room, we like to think that we have some kind of input and to our representative or senators. What, in your opinion, is the best way to make that stay, stay in your mind? 
Oops, sorry. Um, let me tell you, um, it's hard, and, and I'll tell you why. When I was mayor, I loved the fact that I could answer every email, I could take every phone call, I could take every meeting. Um, I've had somewhere, and this is this number's three weeks old. I've had somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty thousand emails, um, and um, so I'm struggling myself with what will what will I pivot to. Uh, these town hall meetings are awesome. I'll tell you, one of the reasons I, I mean, among many that I made the vote that I did, is I knew I would be standing in front of you, and that actually, I couldn't see that. I couldn't see standing in front of you and having made that budget vote. Mm -hmm. And so that's, for me, a component of it is, are, are these meetings. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what to tell you about contacting an office, because that is how we get information, but you're coming in with thousands and thousands of emails. Um, Do they tally it? They say, on this position, yes. We got five yeses, we got ten no's. So, what my staff does is um, they try to give me yes. And so it, it, it goes in and it is, way, it is part of an overall voice that's coming to us, uh, if that makes sense. So, they'll sit down and they'll say, well, you know, we've got this many phone calls on this, and this many on this side, and this many on this side. And uh, I think the offices do a fairly good job of that. But if I were you, I would keep poking and prodding until when it's important, you figure out how to get past that, that wall. And I don't have an answer for you. If you ask me in six months, I, I might have that answer for you of what I'm encouraging people to do. You know, I, every once in a while, I, I weaken and I give out my personal email. And then I go, oh, what am I doing, right? <laughs> because um, I, this is just too many. The volume is too many. And so we've get. <laughs> and, and some of those, if you really have a burning question and, and it's important, you know, sometimes if you co contact your mayor, or I like they we could represent you. And I actually really like that answer. Because sometimes they'll listen to us for some reason. I don't know why. You know, maybe. <laughs> no, I actually really like that number. Um, they would have my cell phone, most of them. If if not, I would certainly give it to them. And so I'm happy to to carry that. Yeah, I, I actually, there's the perfect answer is, and your state legislators. Um, so a combination of that. And then I think the final thing I'd say to answer that question, and then we'll take our last question back here, is it's not feasible to always go back there, but those are very impactful visits when constituents come um, out to the office. Um, and I know it's not feasible for you. Now, we all do have local offices too. And um, if you're just not getting through and you've tried these other things, I'd go visit their local office. And then you're looking at somebody eye to eye. It, it probably wouldn't be me, but you're looking at a district director or somebody that, uh, and, and say, this is really important to me um, to get this message across. Is your, is your office still in this? Is it in the same it's, a, shape it's, it's not. We moved out of the county building because we didn't like the accessibility. And we're, we're a couple miles north on University Avenue. The address is? It's in, the, it's in the Jamestown office complex there. Yeah, and if, if you um, hop on curtis.house.gov, it has the address there and it has phone numbers there. Last question, yes. Um, so in 2016, you love introduced a bill called One Subject at a Time, which um, kind of outlaws riders, um, like this $26 billion um, cap reset where they had the, um, you know, uh, disaster relief and military yeah. stuff, which would, it would outlaw those kinds of things. Would you support a bill of that? Would you co-sponsor? Yes, but I'll be honest with you, the system is rigged, right? <laughs> um, to not let a bill like that get to a vote. Um, uh, I, I, term limits is another good example, right? We keep talking about term limits, and we all say, oh, yeah, we'll support term limits, and I would. Um, but um, it's very hard uh, to get a bill like that up to a vote. Um, Mike Lee uh, makes a very passionate um, argument why he always votes against every single continuing resolution. And um, it's because they won't let him make amendments to it. They, and, um, and he just feels like, I'm not going to vote for it if I don't have a chance to do you know, what you're, you're kind of, one way of what you're talking about, uh, which is to change it. Now, at least I leave you with despair. Let me, um, and some of you will have heard this from me, but let me leave you on a kind of a, to me, a, a point of hope. Um, I've been there uh, three, three months, and I've been incredibly impressed with the quality of people that are my associates uh, and other legislators back there. They are good people. We talk about the swamp, and it, 
I get why we talk about it because of things like this. Um, but I don't really hardly have a conversation where I don't walk away from somebody saying, man, they came here for the same reasons I did. Uh, now, it is fair to say that we're caught in this really weird thing where we're not as productive as you would like and we do things that, that frustrate you. But I want you to know that, I, uh, that there are a lot of good people back there trying to do what they think is best. It's still an amazing country. And um, I've heard from time to time that it's never been this bad. And I always push back when I hear that. I get it. There are things that are really frustrating and that are not good. But we've been in worse places as a country. And the system is remarkably resilient and, and will self-correct, um, I believe, um, over time. And um, I, hopefully that, that gives us hope that it's just not this wasted effort and we're just, we can't get anything passed or can't do anything good back there. Um, once again, my compliments to all of you uh, for coming. Um, and um, Saturday morning, it's a beautiful day. Um, I'll just give you a flavor of my life. Uh, this will be, at the end of today, seven or eight town hall meetings in eight days. Um, I counted up earlier today, I've been on 13 trips back to Washington in 13 weeks. And I actually got a, a place out there so I wouldn't be doing that. But it just seems like every weekend something comes up that's, that's bringing me back. Um, I also want to leave you with these two thoughts. Um, I enjoy what I'm doing. And I, I would never want to give the impression that I don't. Um, this is remarkably rewarding to, to be engaged in these debates and these discussions and to be on the front row. One of my favorite things is we conference as Republicans in a, in a room probably twice the size of this. And there's a microphone on each side. And after we take care of some business, all the, the representatives will line up these microphones and they will debate in a very free flowing, uh, passionate, um, uh, way and and I get to sit right here and I I would rather be right there in one of those meetings than at a Super Bowl it is fascinating it's um, mentally stimulating for me to hear this um, so I really enjoy what I'm doing and the second thing is it's a great honor uh, to serve you and I I, I don't take that lightly um, I realize there's a lot of good qualified people that can do this and it's it's my uh, good fortune to do it right now so thank you and thanks for coming out this morning